Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll call to, to uh, order the Deschutes County Board of Commissioners meeting for Wednesday, October 2nd. We have a, a pretty long agenda today, but hopefully it will go smoothly. Um, so we'll get started. Could you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our first item on the agenda is um, citizen input. If anyone has any, there's blue forms over here. This would be for items that aren't on the agenda. Um, and looks like we've got one. So this is a three minute for anyone to talk about whatever issues. So um, so we'll, we have a request by Ron Buzel, AKA Rondo. You wanna join us? So please uh, speak to the board during testimony. You were, you were talking kind of the audience last time. So this is input to the board and community. Should I just uh, do Well, that? yeah, I mean, you're not speaking to the audience. You're speaking to the board when you're providing testimony. Okay, I can look at them, though. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm just looking. <laughs> Sorry, I just broke it. Uh, I just want to ask a quick question. Uh, somebody asked me something this morning on Facebook. Um, asked me if I um, believe that we should regulate hemp in Central Oregon, in Deschutes County specifically, uh, as we have also regulated marijuana in, in the state and obviously in the county uh, by saying that we have too much marijuana. Uh, are we going to do that now? Are we going to lean toward that because of the, the effect on the local hay market? Thank you. Thank you. Either of you want to comment or? Yes, I know hay is more expensive, and there's less of it, so yes. Okay, um, our next item in the agenda is our consent agenda. Do either of you have anything you want to pull or ask questions about? Or? Um, no. Um, I move we accept our consent agenda for today, October 2nd. And I'll second it. Okay. And... Um, yeah, these are all things we've talked about previously at meetings. Um, so, uh, Commissioner Dare? Yes. Commissioner DeBone? Yes. And the chair votes yes. So, I'll move on to our action items, which are uh, begin with number item number eight. Um, and this is actually um, this is from Community Justice. I think there's a variety of things we're going to talk about. We've got you lined up for four items in a row, I think, or three, no, four. <laughs> so I think part of our goal today really is just to understand how these all fit together, understand what the budgets are, and maybe ask some specific questions on them. I know that, at least that's my my interest is. Well, in the big picture, and we've seen at the Public Safety Coordinating Council, we've talked about it in work session a little bit, is the, this is the follow-on from the legislative session and the uh, biennial plan, so a two-year kind of window that we're setting up for. Very good. Ken Hills with the Community Justice Department with me as analyst Trevor Stevens. Uh, you have four items before you. Uh, in response to your, your question, uh, I'll give a little context. Uh, all four of these items relate to our business with the Department of Corrections. Uh, two of the items relate to the Community Corrections Plan. That is the plan that identifies how we'll spend state monies for the local offender population. It also includes how we spend local monies and our own revenues. Now that's not, that's included in the plan so they get a full picture of all the monies going into the different services. Uh, the plan is specific to the Community Corrections Grant and Aid. Uh, subsequent to adopting the plan, we'll have the intergovernmental agreement for the grant and aid grant. Now the the community corrections grant and aid is the big grant. It's the formula grant. We've been getting this grant since the mid 90s. Uh, the scope of the grant has changed a couple times with passage of uh, Senate Bill 1145 and then a passage of the 
the uh, possession of controlled substance, felony, the misdemeanors, so the scope of it's changed, but the relationship between us providing the local supervision and the state providing us grant and aid for that remains the same. That's the $11 million grant. Uh, grant. The other grants really came after the Community <coughs> Corrections Grant and Aid, and they were, uh, I, you can describe them as enhancement grants. We don't deal with a separate population, but we have specified monies to provide uh, targeted services and supervision to subsets of that bigger population. So, and I'll walk through these and ask for the approvals in a moment, but that includes the Measure 57, which targets supervision and services for drug addicted offenders. And it also uh, includes the Family Sentencing Alternative Program. Uh, these are persons that would otherwise still be in the community corrections population, but it targets special resources, enough money for one PO, plus uh, uh, treatment services for offenders with dependent children with the intent of keeping those children in the home and the offender out of prison. And we work very closely with DHS and the DA on that one. So it's kind of a family preservation model. So these are all like layers of funding on top of the community corrections base grant. So I'm looking, uh, so when you, you went on to the uh, Major 57, I see that it's noted in the biennial budget of the biennial plan, but then we have a separate um, document, so we approve it separately, is that That's basically correct. what we do? Separate grant, it has separate requirements. What they ask for in the plan is how are you going to spend the, or the grant and aid money, but they also ask, how are you going to spend the other monies in the context of the overall plan? So it still requires a separate approval because it's a separate IGA and a separate grant program, even though we talk about it in the same plan. Um, would you like me to go on? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, but of the four items, the first item before you, item eight, is the resolution to approve the community corrections plan. And basically, this, revolu this resolution is a demonstration that the county adopts this plan, and this will be the blueprint on how we'll spend these monies, these, the grant and aid money, uh, and the other state grant monies in the future. It's a blueprint, so they recognize there's some variation to that. But if there's major variation, we have to seek an amendment. But, um, so <coughs> um, if I may, um, I back up. I guess I really explained everything I, I had on here. This plan was approved uh, yesterday at the uh, um, community, uh, the Public Safety Coordinating Council. Uh, with the recommendation that the chair uh, recommend to the board to adopt the plan and submit it to the state. I would ask that the commission uh, adopt the plan and sign the resolution provided. So let me ask you, um, what's the difference between the first of these items and the next three? Um, because yeah, it's like the third one looks kind of redundant the first one because it mentions the same $11 million. Is this this the grant and this was the plan? Is that yeah. what basically? I mean, that's all right. I just yeah, trying to understand. It's just the way the state asked yeah. for it, and, and yeah. it is kind of redundant and complicated because yeah. we seem to be asking for the same thing multiple times. They ask for like a, the resolution to go into the plan, and then a, literally a separate grant agreement to actually approve the whole grant itself. Yeah. So. Okay. Interesting. So when if we go back to the first one, the biennial plan, you have a on page. It's our packet, page 34. There's a list of all the different sources of funding. And this is what you're talking about, that there's some, the big money is the grant and aid, but then there's these other supplementary, or you call them enhancement grants. Is, um, does this list everything that uh, community justice gets, or is there more beyond this, or? That is everything that we're using for community service, or for community supervision. That'll include uh, supervision fees, um, interest on, 
on uh, revenue that we have in the county line. Uh, that may include beginning networking cap that was unspent from prior years. That includes the county contribution plus the other grant contributions. Now some of this is, um, it, I guess it's not, some of it is based on an estimate or a guesstimate of what we'll receive in a subsequent year, like the county allocation. Uh, and then it's based on what we know we'll get with the two-year grants. Does that? Yeah. So the, you have county general fund at 570000 So that's what you're thinking you'll get with two, two separate budget years. And is that all the county general fund that goes into community justice? Or is there? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And is it, this is all the adult side, isn't it? Or is right. there any it's juvenile? Okay. So along those lines, Public Safety Coordinating Council yesterday, uh, the two items, um, misdemeanor supervision and electronic monitoring are basically where those funds are allocated from the county general fund. Uh, electronic monitoring, we had uh, uh, you know, done an update to the contract a month ago or so, uh, acknowledging that the, uh, the, it was an initial estimate and it was kind of dialed in a little bit better, and that's $94,000. Uh, but then also misdemeanor supervision for sex offenders and domestic violence offenders, um, part of domestic violence deferred sentencing program. Uh, it was uh, the DA mentioned it, and the courts were acknowledged it. This is very valuable for uh, you know the system being able to have those local investments. So that's four hundred seventy-six thousand. So those are kind of the two items that are allocated from general fund. And as I say, it was very positive. Uh, everybody around the table yesterday, as I see the sheriff was there, the DA, um, the, the court system, everybody uh, acknowledged that's a very valuable investment for us. So. Can I, um, your third page, you need to correct it. It says 2015 to 2017, the top heading for the Community Corrections Biennial Plan. Biennial plan. That's no. their document, so we will definitely let them know about that. Okay, yeah, I, I went, oh my gosh. <laughs> Um, and then I had a, um, noticing um, the number of offenders that you watch on a monthly average. Domestic violence is like up to 250 and sex offenders is 250. So um, you don't have a total here, but those are the, the most, the two highest categories for our county. So I thought that was really kind of interesting that they were both at the high level. Uh, it's on page 23 of your document. And then I did have a question about your scoring because I'm a new commissioner. Um, on page 18, um, we're talking about the substance abuse treatment. Um, one of the providers was given a 70. What is 100? Is, do you want to get 100 or is a 70 excellent? What is really, really good for the, it's, like it's the correctional program checklist. And so a 70 is actually an extremely high score. I mean, and on average, those providers score in the 40 and 50. Right, I saw other ones that were lower yeah. and I just was. Yeah, it does go to 100, but I mean, I think the highest, I, I, the highest score I've ever seen is like an 80, so. Okay, yeah. so 70 is within yeah, it's, the range. We were, we were very happy with that score for Pfeiffer and Associates. Okay. Yeah. All right, I just. Um, your question related to domestic violence offenders and, sub and sex offenders? Right, yes, that seemed like to be of the parolees, those 500 peop offenders on a monthly basis. Isn't, right. that, isn't it, that your this monthly average? felony and misdemeanor offenders. It does include misdemeanors yeah. too? Okay. So, yeah. So the other presented would be your general street crimes individuals, that, most of the drug and property offenders, yeah. Okay. One of the things we've been, um, so you, we've had a few of the other departments in front of us recently and working through their, what they got from the legislature and seems, and we've had a lot of health, uh, a lot of the health department and it's interesting, some of the programs have gotten a big amount of money, more than they thought, some have gotten less than they thought. What, what have you seen in your departments? Is there any change really from expectations and then from last year or last biennium? Our, we've re, the funds that we have received, we have expected. Uh, we get a forecast from DOC. Our funding isn't as dynamic as, it, as you may see from the health department. There's not as many different uh, streams of money. 
all of our money really comes from two sources, DOC and the Criminal Justice Commission. And the DOC is, is pretty rote now. Through the uh, grant and aid, the Measure 57 is formula driven. Uh, the family a sentencing alternative is just a fixed amount. I don't think that's changed for a while. The formula grants uh, change as our numbers change and they have a little inflation factor, but we're, we usually project that ahead of time. So going into our budget, we make an educated guess. The big question is when we go into our budget, it's when the state is talking about changing the funding. That is adding a new grant, or uh, reductions. They come to the state agencies and they say, give us a 5% cut, 10% cut, and then we have to kind of guess how much of those cuts we may be visited with or not. What's happened in the, in the prior two legislative sessions, not this one, but the prior two prior to that, is this, the uh, governor has asked for major cuts up front from the agencies but the legislature has decided not to make cuts to the community corrections grant. And that's, that's the one time it gets kind of uncertain for us. And that, when you're saying previous legislature, so the 17 legislature and the 15 legislature, yes, the, the big ones. Because in the 17, I remember you were concerned that they, there was talk, the governor asked for a lot less, but you're saying the legislature went ahead and correct didn't do what the governor had asked. And, right. and, and so it ended up not being something you had to worry about, okay. So what happened then to the Family Drug Court? Because um, their grant application was, I think, half of what they thought. I mean, they've met up. I noticed that you have a 20,000 carryover in one of these um, documents that we're looking at. But their funding um, came through a lot smaller than what they were expecting. Yeah, they're from, I'm not sure what the answer to that is. Their funding is not formula-based. It comes from the Criminal Justice Council. Uh, and they have a different rationale on how do they decide who gets how much money. I don't know how they decide what amount goes to Deschutes or other counties. Mm -hmm. But it's not formula based like ours is. Okay. Well, it just was, and, it was unfortunate. And when you're saying formula, is that based on the number of people that live here or the number of people you have in the. Um, uh, system. It's more the latter. Um, it's a very complicated funding system. And basically, to be real quick, the state looks like, looks at all the felony offenders in the state under supervision. They count them up. And they count how many are low, mediums, and highs. And there's a certain value, you know, like a daily rate for each. And then they add those together plus the, uh, Subsidy for housing, um, local control inmates, 12 months or less inmates. There's a, there's a value for that. That all goes into the formula. And then they come out with one big capitated rate. And then they decide which county has what percent of the overall pie, the total amount. And then that's what drives our budget. We typically run between... 4.4 and 4.7 percent from biennium to biennium. Of the total budget of comes the total to budget. County. And that's, yeah. we're about five, I figure when I, we're about five percent of the population, yeah. so. 4.5 actually, I think. I calculated it the other day. We're like less than five, just a little bit. Well, that so close to five, but anyway. Yeah, no. But with the grant and aid, we're entitled to that money Yep. if we meet the conditions of the grant. Okay. And then another just general um, concept. It seems to me that we're, we're prosecuting less things or we're trying to prosecute less things. You know, a lot of the low, um, low level uh, drug related things, some of the, I mean, I, I don't actually know what the DA's come up with after what he said he was gonna do, but it does is that going to result in reductions of funding? I mean, maybe there'll be less people on parole and probation, so there'll be less need for it. But will the end the end result be you'll be getting less money than you we used to in five years? It's possible. 
a big driver on the number of persons under supervision is prosecutorial decision making. Mm -hmm. In reference to what the DA said in a prior news conference, he was targeting persons that we wouldn't supervise anyway. Okay. Uh, so if he ends up, if his practices change the way he prosecutes felony offenders, it could make a difference. Um, kind of go on history there. Okay. Questions or thoughts? Good discussions. Okay, good. I have a question about the community service. I noticed that um, you mentioned Habitat, um, the Humane Society, and um, is the 69,000 that's granted for that, is that to have supervision when they're doing that? Or how do you, how does, where does the 69,000 get spent? spent on community service go toward the two community service supervisors and juvenile, because they also supervise adult crews. So basically the adult budget is picking up some of that cost because half of their time is spent doing adult crews and half of it's doing juvenile crews, even though they're supervised on the juvenile side of the department. Okay, so that 69,000 is like a split? Yeah. That one, okay. Not that it's a big issue, but I was surprised how, lo how low that amount is given how often I see the crews out doing stuff. Yeah. Well, sometimes they're juvie crews, sometimes they're adult crews, they all wear the oh, same vest, so. So this is just the adult side of it? Yeah, it's just a, mm -hmm. okay. for a while, juvie did it without any compensation, and we thought it was better to pick up some of it. Put it in the plan. Yeah. Other questions, Commissioner Dare? Um, I, on the first one, I think these are my questions. I just, um, I was just wondering. This actually was dated. Uh, what is it, July first? But we're not. We're just getting it now, October second. Is, is that standard behavior? That's not uncommon. Uh, what they'll do is they'll give us uh, a quarter's payment based on the prior year, and then when we get all the details worked out, they'll adjust the subsequent payments so the number comes out right. Okay. But. The problem always is we don't find out what we get from the legislature until so late in the session, there's no way to get everything done before the beginning of the fiscal year. I just, um, looking at it, that they're only spending what, the domestic violence treatment is only $30,000, and if we have, you know, a significant number of people that are domestic violators, it seems like that number should be higher. I mean, when you look at where our issues are. Well, uh, many of the violators pay for their own treatment. This is a subsidy we use for certain violators that are indigent. Yeah, historically that population actually is a lot, a large percentage of them are self-pay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Trevor. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Nope. What about on the other? So there's, that's the first packet. Any questions on the? Are we going to do all of them at the same time? Yeah, eight, nine, and ten. Well, okay. I was going to just because they're all kind of connected. Let's see, want to do them separately? Um, talk okay. About them in a row here. On the um, second one, the uh, document two zero one nine six two eight. So the date came from the state then with the wrong date. It says Deschutes. It's on the second page. Deschutes County document summary, and I'm I'm assuming that Denise. Um, Sittler, Sittler yeah. filled it out. So it has the original date is incorrect for the year. I'll make a note of that and make that change. Okay. I mean, I just was like, you know, the if August, anybody. The 2109. Yeah, 2109. I was like, okay, that one was. Um, okay, so this is measure 57 for drug trafficking. Well, my observation would be, I mean, these documents have been proposed, reviewed, uh, Public Safety Coordinating Council, and, and now they're scheduled for us. So, I mean, that may be the beginning date of when this document was put together. So, I don't know that it's wrong. It's just. No, it's well, the wrong year. It's 2109. It's, it's a transposition. Oh, yeah. I mean, okay. it's just. I, was, I wasn't looking. You know, I was just, looking at August 8th. I wasn't, yeah, seeing the year. 
Yeah, it's just um, <laughs> it's just technical, but don't you think it's critical that oh, yeah, it, it should be yeah. done? Yes. Hundred years off. Yes. So, I mean, we haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> so, Measure Fifty Seven was the um, what was what did that do again? Uh, it's the funds to focus on drug addicted or drug and alcohol addicted offenders. Um, I can't remember which which session it came out of, um, but it was a public measure, and the measure talked about um, new sentencing practices for offenders with addictions, but also treatment funds and <coughs> funds for intensive supervision for those offenders. So the measure was passed. Uh, the Department of Corrections instituted a grant program to allocate those funds to county community corrections programs. And I think it starts in the court system, as in the, the definition of how a person is charged or, or right. uh, you know, the sentencing. If and then this is the follow-on. Possession of controlled substance yep. or some other drug-related crime, then they'd be eligible for these funds. And we tag these expenses, right? Yes, these are all project coded because they can only be spent on drug and property offenders. They cannot be spent on like any kind of DV crimes or anything like that. This money is specifically targeted for drug and property crimes. It says here that it was in uh, 2008 that it was passed. So it's been so since then they've funded this program that's just been passed. Mm -hmm. And does this funding change much, or is it does some seem just? The, uh, it does change somewhat because it is formula based, but uh, the allocation has been fairly static, hasn't it? Yeah, I think we saw a three percent change or something. So. Plus or minus? I, th I think it was minus three percent, but that's based on our because we went down from uh, like four point three seven to four point three, based on how they break it up. So their their percentages changed on how they allocated to us. So I don't really know if it was a decrease because our population decreased a little bit. So. But it was like a three percent decrease if you look over that. So, this, um, you know, as we become more of a rec, well, we've definitely become a recreational alcohol place with the beer industry, mm -hmm. and et cetera. Now that actually quite a few um, uh, distilleries here, and then the, with the growing uh, marijuana population, has, have the ch has there been any change in our population in ending up in the? criminal system? I haven't, at our end, we have not noticed any significant change in the number of offenders with drug and alcohol addictions. Or actually being it, it may be because the ones we get are only the felony offenders, not the misdemeanor offenders, and maybe most of this traffic is with misdemeanor offenders. Yeah. We've seen some, I can't remember where I saw the statistics, but the statistics of some things have gone up that are we become more of a party town. They were kind of consistent yeah. with what a party town, but I don't remember. I don't remember this. Huh, okay. Trevor, do you know how many um, children were involved in the Family Sentencing Alternatives Program? Um, so all of those offenders have to at least have a child. A minor child. A minor child. That, I mean, so they they may not have their they may not have them in their custody, but they have to have a child to qualify for that program. So everyone in that program would have had. I mean, depending on how many children they had. So I don't know the exact number, but I can get that for you if you'd like. Okay, because it's, you know, because Oregon has as many children in foster care as the state of New Jersey that has 9 million people, and we have 4.1. So I just was wondering, okay, is this like a significant um, possibility for children, you know, staying with a parent? And I would think that there would be a lot of um, intensity surrounding. It's a very intense program. I mean, the PO meets with them <clears throat> twice a month. They have like daily parenting logs, parenting plans. Work. They're connected with that DHS worker. We pay for parenting classes through the Family Resource Center. There's a contract with them. So it's a, it's a very intense program. And to qualify for it, I mean, there's a lot of scrutiny for that individual before they're, they can make it into that program. So, are you, so Commissioner Dare, are you talking about this, I'll call it the fourth item, the, the IGA for yes. the family sentencing alternatives? Right. That one, because the performance goals are really important, and I just was wondering, what is the impact? Mm -hmm. You're saying we have twice as many. Children, we have as many children in foster care as the state of New Four Jersey. Million. We have 4.1 million, and New Jersey has oh. 9 million, and we have as many children in foster care. So it's like 
why is that and how do we, you know, make a difference so that that, you know, it just it seems overwhelming. And then of course, you know, some of the children were sent out of state and, you know, the foster children. So it's a real it's a really um, a big issue that I know the state's working on. Yeah. This is a pilot program, so we're one of the test counties the, for it. Do you know what other counties Jackson have? County is part of it, Multnomah, Washington and is it Marion maybe the other one? I can't remember. I think so. I think, so. I think it's Marion okay. the other one, yeah. So that's great that we get to be a pilot here. Yeah. No, I mean, you know. So I guess I'd, unless there's other questions, entertain a motion. Um, or we can do them one by one, I guess. Mm -hmm. One by one? Yeah, starting out with um, item package item eight, which is... Resolution number 2019-038. So yeah, I'll move approval uh, board signature of resolution number 2019-038, the Deschutes County Community Corrections Plan for the Department of Corrections Grant and Aid Funding. I'll second it. Okay. Further discussion? Uh, thanks for getting in front of us and explaining some of this to us that we don't necessarily know. So yeah. Thank you. Commissioner DeBone? Yes. Commissioner Dare? Yes. The chair votes yes. Uh, the second item is um, item 2019-628. Um, I move chair signature of document number 2019-628, the IGA for services for drug addicted offenders, uh, measure 57. And I'll second it. Any further questions or, or mm. comments? Uh, Commissioner Dare? Yes. Commissioner DeBone? Yes. And chair votes yes. Third one is the... Number 2019-629. So this is uh, I'll, I'll move signature and board approval of document number 2019-629, Department, uh, uh, State Department of Corrections, IGA, for the grant and aid funding. I'll second it. Uh, Commissioner DeBone? Yes. Commissioner Dare? Yes. And Chair votes yes. Fourth one is 2019-630. Um, I move chair signature of document number 2019-630 IGA for family sentencing alternatives program. And I'll second it. Commissioner Dare? Yes. Commissioner DeBone? Yes. Chair votes yes. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Good time and explanations. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So we'll move on to <clears throat> item number 12, which is um, the board's signature of document number 2019-726, amendment to the Oregon Health Authority um, agreement, and race is here. That's <laughs> 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 yeah. so what it says. So, yes. Tom, welcome. Hi, I'm Tom Kuhn, Community Health Manager at Deschutes County Health Services, and I am here today to recommend the signature of the Second Amendment to the Intergovernmental Agreement with the Oregon Health Authority for the Delivery of Public Health Programs. Uh, Hillary presented to you on the complete intergovernmental agreement this summer. And this is just the Second Amendment, which we can get up to 10 amendments in any given fiscal year on the original contract. Um, and this covers fiscal years 20 and 21. So we're kind of at the beginning of this biennial uh, agreement with the state. Uh, there are three program elements that have changes. Uh, I'll just quick run through those. Um, program element one, state support for public health. And this is what supports our communicable disease efforts in the county primarily. Um, and uh, with all these changes in these program elements, uh, one of the common themes is they were uh, working on their funding amounts and funding formulas. And so they gave us uh, an initial funding to start, and then now they're coming back with the remainder of the funding or the partial funding. So with the um, PEO1, we were funded July through September, and now we receive the remaining balance for the rest of the fiscal year. And so that's pretty much um, all that's going on with that one. Uh, program element 13, tobacco prevention and you get to there. Yeah, sure. So is that what you expected, the 173? Yes, yes, because we our initial balance was approximately a quarter of the total amount. So 
So it, maybe we got just no a little bit more. Then. No, no, not with that one. Uh, tobacco prevention education program that supports our tobacco prevention work. Uh, we were, same thing, funded July through September. The state has been uh, working on adjusting their funding formula. They didn't have it figured out by July 1st, so they gave us bridge funding for July through September. And they still hadn't had it totally figured out, so then they extended the bridge funding for October and November, which is uh, what we see here, the uh, 22,000. 22, that takes us uh, through November, and then we are hoping to find out in the next month what the funding amount would be December through June. And um, as I said, same thing, they changed their funding formula and are trying to figure it out, and it's taken them a little longer to get that straightened out um, uh, than, than they usually would. And a lot of that has to do with discussions with the CLO group, conference local health officials. When they do funding formula changes, they often meet with CLO repeatedly and try to agree upon uh, what makes most sense for the local health districts. I think I was at um, the health meeting yesterday, and I believe that there are five people on ventilators, young people right now with the vaping issue mm -hmm. in the state of Oregon. So um, I'm sure they are wondering which way they should go. Yes, we're really uh, shifting our, our focuses on e-cigarettes and vaping, uh, youth use and access, because that's becoming a real issue. And uh, the state is also really reacting to that now. And uh, yeah, we're, we're really hoping something can be done to reduce uh, those rates, which are really going high. In our regional health improvement pro program also, that's gonna be what you and I worked yeah. on together. Uh, that's going to be a uh, top metric for substance use and substance and alcohol uh, use prevention that we would reduce the uh, rate of e-cigarettes and vaping amongst youth, so. so. So is that the direction we're gonna go is we're gonna try to reduce the vaping and the e-cigarettes and yeah. so are we back to regular cigarettes are better than? Well, they don't kill you immediately. What, what we've seen with the data is that while the rates of e-cigarettes and vaping are going up, the rates of youth tobacco use are going down. But then the interesting fact is um, adolescents who use e-cigarettes or vape are more likely to smoke as adults, is what the data is showing. So even though you're using cigarettes less now, if they use e-cigarettes and vaping, they're, yeah, then they convert to cigarettes when they become older. So that's what the data is starting to show. So it's kind of a confounding problem. And then now we're having deaths and like you said, hospital admissions, and you know, we don't know what's being put into those devices. And marijuana, of course, so. Yeah. THC. Yes, any. Especially with kids, I mean, I think they put everything in these. In a yeah, and it's not regulated, it's, it's so. It's a cool thing. I, mean, mm -hmm. more, I think more cool than cigarettes were when we were young. I mean, I don't know, cool, cigarettes were cool to some extent, but. Well, this has become because it's almost because it's a device. It's become cool yeah. or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, like they can have a flash drive. They have yeah. things that look like that or, you know, just every day a pen. And you, Silas, yes. Yeah, and you can be sitting in, you know, the back of the classroom and using that. The teacher might not even notice and, you know. Well, they have it in, designed into their clothes. I mean, this was a yeah. couple of years ago. I went to a seminar with Clear Alliance and they were showing everything and I was like amazed. And it's only gotten worse. Yes. So one question to yeah, sure. prevention and education. Are, is there a specific expectation or line item for the retail licensing program? And I know this just keeps kind of getting kicked around yeah, year after year. Yeah. But my question is, is sure. does the state call that out specifically as a effort that they're funding that they expect to see? You know? Yes, yes, that's one of the uh, several uh, big aims that the state has. Uh, protecting the Clean Indoor Air Act, which is, um, uh, focused on indoor tobacco use as well as outdoor and you know trying to protect employees at restaurants in addition to the patrons um, tobacco free government properties um, we worked on that um, gosh I think about six years ago and we were able to have uh, Deschutes County properties go tobacco free and also working with like the library and the community college and um, you know just continuing those efforts here in Bend and throughout the cities of Deschutes County. And tobacco retail licensure, which we've been working on as part of the state 
work plan since about 2016, so that's something they are really trying to push that we work on at a local level to assess if it's feasible or what makes the most sense to implement it. Um, that's something we're going to be coming back and revisiting with the commissioners um, here in the next month or so to give you an update of where our efforts are at and ask for any guidance or thoughts upon those efforts. But I'm just acknowledging that, you know, we've we haven't given clear guidance as a board, and I, I haven't been supportive of an, a license at that retail location, just mm. the business sense of sure. it. Uh, but, you know, uh, early uh, diversion and, you know, uh, development folks, uh, the long-term effects of smoking and tobacco, I mean, there's there's a lot to support there. But then there's just this licensing thing has been something that, uh, as I say, I haven't been supportive of. So we're accepting dollars from the state, which is a line item saying you shall try or you all – you know, get the word out about licensing. So we're just kind of a little bit of a conflict there. Yes. And, I, you know, I, we haven't really voted on that or anything. I'm just speaking as one commissioner. Well, yes, sure. We've talked about those, some, and, I, and I've had the same issue that you've had. So yeah. Uh, so I'm acknowledging that if the state has a line item saying you shall do this and we're receiving monies for that, this may be the point where we think, oh. yeah, Where So is that in this budget as we look at? Yeah, it, it's, it's in uh, – the funding, like I said, for the last three years, it's been in there. It's in the, the overall intergovernmental agreement. It's uh, for the funding um, that we're going to do the rest of this year. And it's for us to work on that, to assess if that's feasible. Maybe it's not feasible at the county level. Maybe individual cities want to go that route, and that's what we're trying to figure out at this time. It would be good if you came to yes. we had a meeting in the next month because I, it's – the only person that ever talked to me about it seriously was Nathan Bodie, who was a city councilor. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I share this concern that. Well, and we put you in a spot, you know, because you just mentioned the word, is it feasible? Heck yeah, it's feasible. I mean, if we all said we're going to do this and we're going to give, you know, more staff, more authority and, a, uh, you know, authority to go write somebody up for not having this, the, that that's the political will that I don't think is there. It's just I'm acknowledging. Okay. Sure. Okay. Any other questions about this? Um, the, um, the uh, did you speak on the uh, no? Th that's the last one. Uh, program element twenty-seven, and this promotes the Oregon prescription drug monitoring program. As we know, um, overprescribing by pharmacists and providers has been a big issue in uh, recent years, and. This program works to educate those providers and pharmacists about the appropriate levels of prescriptions uh, to be giving people. I myself, like two years ago, had minor knee surgery, and they gave me 30 Percocets. And, you know, I took it at the time, not even thinking about it, and then I got home, and I was like, what am I going to do with this? So Did you go back and the talk to them? The first few were important, but after that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I... You really need to talk to your doctor about it. <laughs> yeah. Honestly and truly, because... Doctors should not be over prescribing those kind of. Um, I know somebody that was given like 40 um, oxycotton, Can't you know, for nothing. That's well, if, the issue. Well, Can that's the problem. Working? But no, I mean it's yeah. you know it's coming from a doctor and um, as much publicity as opioid overdoses and everything and the value and the selling of pills that it really needs to be changed. Yeah. So that was what three years ago. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So maybe they weren't quite aware. Yeah, no, I think that the tension yeah, three years ago is barely years. an issue. Yeah. yeah. It's really well, I, I knew it in the 90s, though, because I knew someone that was given all these Oxycontin, and I knew it was a really, um, it was so unnecessary. Um, and, you know, people will, some people will ask for more yeah. because they know well, what's going on. Yeah, or they can sell them. Yeah, too. they sell them. Yeah. There's quite a business in that, yeah. That's for sure. Somebody, or people steal them, too. So, okay. Uh, any other questions, or can we get a motion to support? Uh, I just wondered, is that um, is that funding what you expected then? Uh, yes, it's, it is. It's what we expected up to it's this. Right point. online. Yeah, These are all follow on. Yeah, in the first quarter after the legislative session. Yes. Well, because the one isn't finished. Yeah, there's a, the tobacco one's the one that hasn't been finished yet. The funding, right. but the the other two are the full funding amounts for the fiscal year. But then again, there are times when the state comes up with more money with one month or two months left in the year that they uh, give out to locals too. So that does happen. Okay. All right. So I move um, we have board signature of document number 2019-726, amendment to Oregon's health authority agreement. And I'll second it. Uh, Commissioner Dare. 
Yes. Commissioner Devon? Yes. The chair votes yes. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Tom. Thanks. All right, we'll have, uh, we're right on schedule. We'll have a consideration of board signature document number 2019-699 and the denial of the Niemzow Marijuana Production on Sterling Drive. Good morning for the record. Izzy's back. My name is Izzy Liu, Associate Planner with the Deschutes County Planning Division. Um, so like Commissioner, you said, this is the final version of the denial of the marijuana production facility at 60148 Sterling Drive. Good. So I, th I thought you did a good job, I don't know how many of you all worked on this, but of kind of broadening out the, the um, discussion of the Youth Activity Center and coming up with the words. I had a couple uh, thoughts. I don't know if I want to change anything. I'm just bringing it up. It's hyper kind of technical, but this, if this decision ends up influencing other decision, decisions, it may be worth considering. Um, so that's my thought. Either of you have opening thoughts, or do you want to get right into the wording? Or no, I, 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 I like your changes. I yeah. thought they were. Incorporate the the amount, the volume of activity as well as the the regularity of use. So, um, I in the top. So I'll go right to the wording in page five on the third line down. Uh, scheduled swim time for a large volume of children. Uh, um, I just wonder if that should be significant number of or volume of children. I, large, I'm not sure what large means, and I don't want that to be the new test by the Luba or whoever is is something large because I don't know whether six is large or oh, um, sixteen. Do you have the new one? Because mine doesn't say that. No, large. Oh, the third, oh, large, large volume. volume. Well, so I just wondered if it should be, and I'm just bringing this up as, um, and if either of you have thoughts on that, large versus significant. If you like large, it's fine with me, but. Significant, they could think they're large children, so maybe changing it to significant would make more sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um. So down below in the third paragraph, then, where, it's, where we've got the list of different activities, interprets these facilities and activities located specifically at the ranch to constitute YACs. I don't know if I really think each one of those is a YAC. To me, I think collectively they make the place a YAC. So I don't know. That's just a thought I have. So, um, but I, we really haven't talked about it. Do you feel like each one of those is a YAC? Or do you think it's the collective, the fact that they're all there makes? Well, I think listing what to for nine of them, I think it's significant because there are, um, you know, there are children involved in that whole area. So to me, I thought it was, um, it demonstrates what's really happening, and it, it's very clear. Right. But you no. see, what I'm asking is, the way it's worded now, it interprets these facilities and activities located specifically at the ranch to constitute YACs. So do you think each one of those is a YAC? Or if, assuming this might get appealed, could, could, it be, could it be struck down because Commissioner they'll say, Thompson. well, the picnic area doesn't have enough evidence, so that is no... Right. I don't know the relevance. I'm just saying when I thought about it, I didn't get to the end of the weeds and decide which were and which weren't. I just said, boy, there's a lot of youth activities that are regular and take, have a lot of people. So, and I, so I just wanted to say at the ranch to collectively constitute a YAC or so, something. But I don't know your thoughts on this, so that's what I'm asking. Do you think everything's a YAC? So the activities listed under there, it's the way that this is written, it seems like it's talking, so it's especially at the ranch, so it's these activities that were identified um, as being a part of the Sundance Meadows Ranch, and these special activities are what were considered the Youth Activity Center. Well, I, I agree with that, but mm -hmm. is it because they collectively agree? I mean, what if there was only a picnic area? Would that be a YAC? Or if there was only a 
BMX track. Because if I was attacking this on appeal, I'd be raising those issues. I'd be saying, well, there's no evidence of this, 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 and this, and try to whittle it down. But um, David? Well, I think the language impliedly indicates that it's collective, but I think that would be a great clarification to expressly state that and see Izzy nodding her head, so I think she's already captured that. You're all right yep. with that, okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay, to collectively constitute a YEC, yeah. So, uh, scenario, uh, we live in a rural property in Deschutes County next to an EFU parcel, and I think of my backyard, uh, bocce ball court, horseshoes, picnic area, remote control t track, uh, you know, kids on bicycles, ATV riding around the property, horse barn and correct. I mean, everything on here is exactly what I, I have done on my property, and we're next to an EFU parcel. So that's why I see it differently here. I just, I don't see the fact a private property with activities is different than a, a certified place where you drop off your child for the day. So i just clarifying why I would see it differently. And as I say, everything on this list that we do, I, we don't have a fishing pond, but everything else we have done on our property. you have a golf course? Uh, we live next door to one. Well, you know, the only difference I see is that you don't advertise the, the, the bone well, play ranch. But this is, like a, this this is a ranch so this, which is fractional is or membership uh, ownership for somebody to bring a family to do activity, which is like private property. And it's still not a certified daycare or boys and girls club. So I understand that's the dif that's the distinction. So, and it reads that I don't support yeah. the words in this. Yeah. Okay, so you make that change, and then the only other, the third one I had was down in the next paragraph. I just was going to add. Um, uh, Commissioner Henderson noted that the marijuana advisory committee discussed licensed youth activity centers, but the word license was omitted. From the Deschutes County Code, therefore, the term was left undefined. And I added, and licensed is not required, because if they'd if they'd wanted license to be required, they could have put it in because they considered it. So that's a small change. If, are you okay with that? Yes, that's your quote. Is that <laughs> you? It's your quote. It's your quote. So yeah. You <laughs> may you may clarify your quote. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Isn't it? You said, yeah. Yes, well, I'm I guess sure. it is. I don't know if I said that then, but I'm saying it now. I guess I might have said it then. Okay. Well, those, I think it, otherwise it's, um, the form's good and I'd be ready to sign it. So. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Are you ready to sign it also? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm ready to sign so it. So wh what's our deadline? Um, it's October 11th, but um, these seem like minor edits that I can do yeah. today. And, uh, yeah, if you can bring it back, we're going to meet um, now, and we may, we're may we going to probably meet this afternoon, too, if you want to bring it back to, for signature. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the applicant and the appellant probably would like to put this to rest. So, okay. So perhaps we get a motion to yeah. approve that uh, with those changes? Okay. I move we um, approve the changes made on uh, the document for, let's see, where's my... Number um, document number two thousand nineteen. Uh, yes, two thousand nineteen six nine nine. The denial of the Nemshow so marijuana production at six zero one four eight Sterling Drive Bend. And I'll second that. And uh, Commissioner Dare. Yes. Commissioner Bone. I vote yes, uh, d acknowledging the documents as my opposition. Okay. And uh, chair votes yes. Thank Thanks you. for getting that done. Absolutely. See you this afternoon. Okay. Uh, item number 14 is an overview of the Bend Airport and FAA, FAA master planning process. So we've got some help. Nick's going to lead this, and you've got help, right? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Nick Legalak, Deschutes County Community Development Director. Um, I, I not only have help, I actually have the presenters. Um, so Carolyn Egan, the City of Bend's Economic Development Director, and I'm not sure if Gary Judd, the Airport Director, will join her, but if so, I would invite you both up. Uh, they have a presentation. I'm, uh, we didn't have a chance to coordinate this morning before, so I'll load that up as, as they come up, and they'll begin to provide an overview. Uh, Peter Russell, our Senior Transportation Planner, and I are here to answer any questions um, that you may have of county staff um, based on what you learn in the overview. So I'll be happy to turn it over to... Carolyn and Gary, and we'll go from there. 
It was great. I saw Gary on TV this morning. Yes. I was like, how appropriate is that? We did, I wish third busy. That. Yeah, I know. Third busiest airport busy in the state. Yes. Oh, yeah, uh huh. My. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner, I'll just add to Nick's introduction on this. Um, the <clears throat> session this morning is really a result of a meeting that uh, Nick and I had with Carolyn and Eric King, the city manager, to, in an attempt to sort of frame for you all the path that's in front of us for examining the Bend Airport Master Plan, uh, the Bend Airport generally, uh, to kind of uh, set the context. There's several tasks uh, before you uh, in terms of, of reviewing the, the plan itself and, and some um, questions for you along the line, but we thought it would be good because we've talked about this sort of piecemeal uh, over the last six months, came up briefly at the joint meeting we had with Ben Council some time ago, we thought it would be useful to sort of frame the whole thing. So you have an understanding of what the expectations are, what the tasks are, and not that we do that all today, but, but today's session would be sort of a, a timeline on uh, you know, what's in front of you uh, and uh, the, the milestone uh, events that, that go along with uh, the review of the Bend Airport. So. Um, you know, the first of several sessions today, but again, with the idea of education and background uh, as we move forward. And I'll acknowledge real quick, I mean, I, you know, I was invited to join some of the committee work here and then we're in that spot where we're not sure if it's a quasi-judicial application coming to us or a legislative matter. Uh, we have history with uh, residents uh, in the neighborhoods uh, uh, surrounding uh, you know, being impacted and, and bringing those issues to our attention. I really like the economic development activity and the, uh, uh, you know, the, the industry and the technology of it. So, I'm, yeah, we're kind of in the middle of this, so that we're just trying to work that out a little bit. Great. Well, I'm Carolyn Egan. I serve as the city's economic development director, and I'm just thrilled to be here today with Gary Judd. We actually only have Gary for several more weeks. He has officially announced his retirement. So, um, <laughs> I'm scared to death, um, but also really eager at the opportunity to um, learn more about what's going on at the airport and really share with you um, what goes on out there, why aviation is important, um, and how this airport really fits into an overall transportation system. Um, I've jokingly said to the group of commissioners before was, Deschutes County has significant aviation assets um, and really getting you to understand where the Bend Municipal Airport fits in that asset. So we wanted to, we really took a step back almost, Tom, from what you are describing today, is we talked about airports in general, why aviation and airports are important, um, what's gone on at the Bend Municipal Airport over the last 20 years, and then how that is leading into the master planning process that we are involved in. We've got a bunch of time for you to ask us questions, so stop. I don't understand that term. Tell me what that means. That, that's really what this um, discussion is meant today. Um, if we can't answer it, we will come back and talk about that more with you. We don't want to assume any knowledge on your part. Having been, I came into economic development director, I knew we had an airport in four years it's taken me just barely to learn what we're going to present today. So I don't expect you to understand that all in a 20-minute presentation. That's like us trying to understand our health department. <laughs> yeah, and, and the sheriff, and planning, and yeah. Oh, those are easy. The health department's the <laughs> so, um, so please, I mean, even from the first slide, stop us and ask us questions. Um, and then really wanted to finish the presentation up with roles and responsibilities. I think the role of the county, the role of the city, the role of the Federal Aviation Administration, the role of the Oregon Department of Aviation um, can be complicated and a little bit difficult to navigate and we haven't figured it all out yet. So that's what we're here to do today. So again, why airports are important. What is the Bend Municipal Airport? I think there's a lot of un misunderstanding of where this um, urban GA airport, you have a significant urban asset in the middle of a very rural county. Um, and that just, just saying that sentence creates conflict. <laughs> um, and so talking about what the airport is and then going through roles and then making sure we have time for discussion. Okay. Um. First off, too, on the subject of my retirement, Carolyn, as you notice, is a very quick study. She just got back from the Oregon Airport Managers Association meeting, was able to meet with the FAA and the state. Uh, I think it's in good hands. Uh, I think that uh, it'll, it's going to continue on the trajectory that it's on. So uh, I'm excited to see the future for it. 
been even more excited to see it from retirement. So <laughs> thank you. Um, a little bit about the airport. As you can see in all of Oregon, there's 97 airports. Uh, there's six commercial service ones. Seven of the airports are in central Oregon. Four are in Deschutes County, and there's a multitude of local airstrips. And the significance of that is, is that the number of airports is what makes aviation work. If you have a very few airports, there's no place to go. You can't depart your community. You can't land in another community. You're just stranded. So in it, the whole part of aviation is the ability to be mobile and to visit all those different small communities. So as a whole, uh, the availability of airports in every single community is critical that we have it. Sister's not on there? Sisters is on there. Yeah, Sisters is in there it, somewhere. It's one it of is. the four Deschutes yeah. County airports for sure. Yeah, we've got um, Redmond, Sun River, Sisters. Sister, been. Yeah, I was wondering maybe there was a different designation. So. Those are probably all public airports. Yeah. They could have, yeah, they might have dropped them off there because yeah. it is a privately owned airport. It's on our next Well, list. and that's, that's why I'm asking that question. Is there a right. distinction between those two? There, there can that's, be. Yeah. They're, they're like Sun River is a public use airport, but it's privately owned. Uh, Sun River is the same, excuse me, Sisters, and, and in Sun River is the same way. There are airports that are private, and they have little emblems that you're not welcome here unless you're a member of our HOA or our residential group, but they still serve as emergency strips. Yeah. Uh, people can use them as some place to land. So there is a difference on how they're funded. Um, the airports, too, in um, there's a limited number in the state that are federally eligible for age from the FAA. Uh, sister, oddly enough, is eligible, but they won't give them any money. <laughs> so we haven't quite figured out, but they're an AIP airport. Sisters is not, so there is a difference in those. So any questions about this slide or anything on it? Or? I think one thing that's really important, go ahead, you can flip this slide, but even the director of the Oregon Department of Aviation said, you know, you drive past that little airport in Oak Ridge, and it seems pretty insignificant, but if you're the pilot who just got over the Cascades and you've got instrument failure, that airport in Oak Ridge is really important to you at that minute. Um, so it really is about a system of airports, um, and each of those airports, I think, is, as um, Commissioner DeBone is highlighting, has a different part in the hierarchy, um, and that's really important just I mean, as we think of all of the decisions that we have to make as community leaders and elected officials, um, we help our citizens make decisions for their worst day um, that they haven't even contemplated. Um, and that's one of the roles that airports play. And on this next slide, we're talking about like emergency response. And there's, there's a couple things that come to mind. Obviously, the Cascadia event. And a lot of the entrance is, is focused on Redmond, as it well should be. It's got the bigger runways. But what we're going to see if that happens is everybody pictures, I think, everybody from the coast is going to run over to this side. And I don't think so. You're going to stay close to home and family and friends and do the best you can. But what happens is the onslaught of support. You have the media. You have the military. And it's going to quickly overwhelm probably Redmond, Sisters, Prineville, Bend, it's going to be huge. And so those are the things that we want to be there ready for them when they come uh, as much as we can be. So that's one of the aspects of it. The other part of emergency response is that in eastern Oregon particularly and in other parts of the state is we have uh, Airlink and uh, Life Flight and that connection with St. Charles. And uh, my background was from John Day. And to live in those small communities out there where you're doing the, the the agricultural and support industries that help keep the urban areas going <laughs> Is you really don't want to live there if it's four hours driving to a hospital and something happens to one of your kids. Uh, twice my children have actually rode on AirLink coming in. So that part is absolutely critical to the region as a whole is that we have that. And for Ben particularly, St. Charles, that connection is obviously the revenue, the cost of the flights. Uh, it can be upwards of $20,000 for a flight coming in from John Day. But that access and the ability to get here is critical. So I think from that point of view is, is from a, my personal, is that emergency ability to be there for other people is really important. Um, the access, too, for the airport is if you, if some of these other charts will show is that the, air, the airspace in the United States is basically highways in the sky. And uh, you think about it in the terms of the airlines, but it's true of everything that flies. And with GPS, it's becoming even more so that you can go point to point. You don't have to go up and get onto a navigation airway and fly a convoluted route from here to, say, Boise. You can just get in your airplane, punch your GPS, and go. But if you don't have an airport, you have no access to that system. All of those aircraft, all of that revenue being generated, all of that transportation goes to some other community. You're, you basically do not have an off-ramp to the I-5 in the sky. So that access is incredibly important, and it goes both ways. We have people that live in Bend, and they regularly commute to San Francisco. It's four hours. 
I mean, I can't drive to Boise that quick, I don't think. <laughs> At least I probably better not I try. shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> shouldn't. If you that's can, we don't want to hear about yeah, it. Yeah, that's it. We don't want to know. Yeah, I drive slow. So, um, But that is something that, that sometimes is missed is what makes a community work. And one of the things that um, is hard to pinpoint, but I don't believe you'll find a successful community that does not have a successful airport, especially in the growth phases. It's really critical. And it does tend to draw people that are – uh, tend to have more funds, they can invest, they can be in stuff. But the other part that I kind of want to point out is that it's not a, we call it it's airport for private people. But well, what we mean is it's a public use airport for people that own private aircraft. And that doesn't mean that it's an exclusive club. It is much more accessible than, say, the Redmond Airport or Portland International. You can drive out to the airport, get in your own airplane, fly when you want, come back when you want. It's total freedom to come and go as you want. So it is totally a public use airport. And I think that's one of the misnomers we run into is, oh, it's just corporate jets. And, uh, you know, disclosure, I, I own my own aircraft, and I hop in it and go to John Day and visit the kids. It's great <laughs> <Makes> it <laughs> when the weather works. Easier. I think yes. one of the two other points on access is from an economic development director standpoint, you'll hear there's always this urban legend. Maybe it's a rural legend. Um, but how the city manager invested in a new sign on the highway coming into their town, and everybody was ready for this um, big Fortune 500 CEO to come into town. Um, and then he flew in. And he got out of the airplane and said, you're not ready for me yet. Um, and the city manager's almost in tears, like, we invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in our road infrastructure, but CEOs fly into your community. They don't drive into your community. And so when you're thinking about access to your community for where you're going to grow your employment base and a diversity of employers, you really are thinking about accessing airports. Um, and in terms of the Bend Airport, that's really what we see. I think the other thing that we see is that linking to emergency response, when we talk about needing runway extensions or control towers or um, repaving of runways, we're trying to accommodate larger planes um, for emergency access. So in the Cascadia event or in the next fire event, what are the size planes that the air – the Forest Service is going to need to land at the Bend Municipal Airport so that we can protect – um, our wildlife or our wildfire areas. Um, what are the um, safety, the medical evacuation flights that are going to have to make it into the Bend Airport? And so when we think about some of the concerns that neighbors have, you know, if you do a bigger runway, I'm going to have more activity, or if you do a bigger runway, I'm going to have bigger planes flying over my house. Maybe, um, but largely when, you, when we get into roles and responsibilities, we're building those so that we can, we can prepare for our community on the worst day. Um, and not necessarily just trying to generate a whole bunch of economic activity. So you're balancing those needs um, from, a federal, from a federal viewpoint um, as you're thinking about all these things going into airports, too. Yeah. And then uh, the next bullet point there is the employment. And I just got the, the – from the employment department yesterday sent me the statistics. There's uh, 429 employees and uh, just slightly shy of $23 million in payroll coming off the airport. That's direct primary dollars. And so that's running out. Um, we'll get through some of the other slides too, but basically the impact that has uh, in a regional level uh, is around $174 million as its secondary dollars that rolls through. So that kind of covers this slide, but I say the employment, and the employment I think is going to jump pretty rapidly. Uh, Epic's about ready to go to certified aircraft production, and that's going to make a big change. What, um, when you're saying employment, I'm assuming you're all the businesses that surround. On the, right, they're on the airport. They're, they're on the airport. Are, there's actually 16 businesses on the airport. Are all of those um, dependent on being by the airport, or are some of them there because they have a good hangar to work out of? Or? Some more than others. <laughs> yeah. It's been an ongoing discussion, and, and kind of the litmus test is, you know, if they weren't where there's an airport and they had access to the runway, could they survive? And there's always – there's are there are companies that they outgrow it, they have an airplane, they have an office, and they keep growing, and pretty soon they have more office workers than they do airplanes. Yeah. Those companies, it's probably best that they transition, and sometimes that takes quite a long time. But the vast majority of them, if without a runway, they would be out of business. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of the, the litmus that, test on it. And that guidance changes from the FAA. So um, if sometimes we feel like, well, well, our ideal situation would be, A, um, that we only have businesses on the airport that need access to a runway, um, the FAA may come in and say, well, and they describe more of a scenario what Gary's just described. So we're always working between – we're serving probably three masters as we run this airport and making sure we're in compliance with the federal rules that may change 
and sometimes they go forward and come back, yeah. um, and then also dealing with all the other land use commitments that we've made to the airport. So, But ideally, as Gary's described, they are um, all different types of businesses in all different industries that need, that need access to a runway or um, uh, some sort of pad for helicopters. They don't all have to be fixed-wing aircraft. And this next one, we, we had this put together of where the flights are originated in different spots across the country. And you can't really tell it on the slide. They're actually color-coded as to which ones had the most. But the, the overall picture is that pretty much everywhere in the United States, flights originate and come to and go from, from Bend back to those points. So it really is a critical part of it. You can see the really big clusters is down uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle, uh, Portland area. Those are the areas that are, are getting the most traffic, but they come from just almost anywhere, and it makes a difference. And uh, like I said, there's uh, there's not too much foreign traffic, but we even have a little bit of that, but they didn't show it on the chart. So These are where people are starting, where they're starting their flights into Bend. Right, and they originate and then come, in, come into the uh, Bend Airport. Hey, this one, and I, I apologize, I cannot read it from there, and yeah. I don't have it in front of me. These are the seven <laughs> so, um, Central Oregon the, um, uh, I'll just step up a little closer so I can see it. You can see the traffic on it is that we, we show about 140,000 operations at, in uh, Bend. And this, this numbers are a little bit old, but they're coming out of the most recent report from the Oregon Department of Aviation. And traffic-wise, you can look at Madras, Prineville, Redmond. And the impact is different, like Redmond's showing 40, 41,000, and uh, they've actually increased that now. It's up closer to, I think, 98,000 operations, because they're also being impacted by the flight schools that we're hitting. But the point being is that they move a lot more people, we move a lot more aircraft, but it's growing and it's increasing uh, exponentially. So like I said, you know, 66% of all the operations, an operation is either a takeoff or a landing. So if you watch a little airplane go out and do a touch and go, that's two operations. And, and we're 43% uh, of the based aircraft are at the Bend Airport. And that's partly driven because uh, the Redmond Airport services the commercial areas and uh, that commercial traffic, uh, but they are focusing more on general aviation and providing more services there, which we are glad. We welcome that because some of the, the really large jets and stuff we have are probably better served in Redmond. And hopefully we can pull away some of the, the smaller aircraft from, from what they're doing and, and limits their capacity for the jets. So. Um, any questions about that? Or like I said, I apologize, it's a little hard to read, but. I think that's, I think just one of the big pieces, you know, where we talk about it being the third busiest airport in Oregon, it, it is because of takeoffs and landings. And I know there's some sort of rolling of eyes, even from our counselors, about, well, that's because of the flight school, so it's not really activity coming in and out of the airport. Um, but from a safety standpoint, it is, there are takeoffs and landings that are coming, that are happening at the Bend Airport. And so when we think about some of the safety investments that the FAA will probably ask us to make um, in our next master plan, it really is getting at just this pure number of, of operations. The Central Oregon airspace is quite busy. Um, and so we have the Redmond Tower calling us at times saying, you've got a busy airport. Um, and so really thinking about all of this collectively, um, how do the airports work together and how do we invest the right dollars and in the right facilities at, at all of our airports. So do you have any idea when this, when these numbers, when they're from? These would be probably 2016, 16, 16 17, numbers published in 17. Oregon Department of Aviation did a report on all the airports, and they went to a new format where they're just going to keep constantly updating it. So I think they've got a newer update that's got a little bit newer numbers than what that is. But um, like significantly like with Redmond, the operations, their Hillsboro Aviation came into Redmond and is doing right. a lot of flight instruction. So that's really bumping those numbers up. And so that makes a difference. Also, the number of people they're moving is way beyond what we move. I mean, obviously, every airliner yes. that takes off is, is quite a bit higher. And one of the things we're working at now, too, is airspace conflict. You know, we've got a really busy airport in Redmond, a busy airport in Bend, and the approaches coming in, which are imaginary lines. You can't see them, but that's how the aircraft approach. We're working at trying to deconflict de that, and we're working with air traffic control, just discussing what we're seeing, what's going on, where the traffic's at. And, uh, so, and there's new technology coming out called ADSB. And in a small aircraft, just a single engine Cessna 150 trainer, you now have visual of all the traffic that's around you. And it's being mandated January 1st, all aircraft within certain airspace has to have it. 
and uh, that is making a big difference as far as awareness. So you might hear more people going, oh wow, it's so busy. Well it is, but they're now seeing traffic that they never could have seen before. So there's that. So there is a lot of adjustments. They added a new sector from air traffic control out of Seattle just for Central Oregon because of the busyness of it. So we're, we're seeing a lot of <coughs> that kind of impact. What does sector out of Seattle mean? I don't understand. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the, the, um, and and I'm, I'm kind of a little bit of a novice at, at some of it too, but each controller is given a geographical area. They say that's your piece of real estate. You watch the traffic and as aircraft travel across the country, they hand it off from one sector controller to another. And it got so congested here that they had two control, two sectors. They said, we just can't keep up with it all. So they added a third sector. So that evidently brings in a third controller or it takes it at a higher elevation. And we've actually seen um, uh, pictures and stuff where it shows the targets of how busy they are. You know, the good news is, you know, they've got radar and they're keeping track of it. But um, it is, it's, it's straining the system all the way around is keeping up with it. But that's, that's what growth does. So I was surprised in the, the Redmond Airport when I, went, I did a tour there and went up in the tower that they didn't have like radar locating all these planes. It's like, seriously? You know, you know. That is a big discussion that, that um, yeah. I think all of us would love for them to have radar in that tower. Yeah, and then you know, the bend doesn't really have a tower, right? There's no tower. And so when would that, when do you expect that I mean, I don't know that's beyond. You hold that question until we get to the <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, and one, I would want to keep moving. I'm looking at the time behind your head, oh, yeah. Mary, but um, yeah. is that one of the reasons? So at towered airports, those men and women who are in the tower are telling the flight instructors and the commercial pilots when to land and when to take off. Um, when you don't have a tower, people are doing it by line of sight and on radio. So non towered airports, when they're busy like Bend, have the ability to almost have more operations than you could ever have in real estate tower may never let that amount, those amounts of things happen at one time. Oh. But our airspace isn't any different than any other infrastructure that we are grappling with in Central Oregon right now um, and needing to invest in that infrastructure. In fact, the next slide, yeah, real quick, and I'll, I'll jump through this because I see you know, our time is starting to get down, but the comparisons between Redmond and Bend, and this isn't, we need, Redmond Airport is absolutely critical to the growth in Central Oregon. We need that commercial service. So we're, we're two different types of airports that, that do two different meet two different sets of needs. But just kind of roughly, you know, Redmond has a tower, Red Bend doesn't. They have aircraft rescue and firefighting. Uh, ours is, is the closest facility is on Neff Road uh, for the city fire part. Uh, they have two runways. We have one. Uh, they, we don't have commercials or air service. Uh, they have TSA security. We don't have any security. They have security fencing. We have a three-strand barbed wire fence. Um, they have snow equipment, and the amount of snow removal equipment they have is, is astronomical. They can clear the runways in about 20 minutes. It takes us three or four hours. Uh, their traffic count, as you can see, is quite a bit different. The based aircraft, there's a significant difference. They have a lot more uh, land that they can develop eventually and more protection from encroachment around them. And the revenues, they bring in about $12 million. They have a passenger ticket tax, which helps fund what they do. We have the budget of whatever we bring in off of the leases and whatever we can convince the city of Bend to provide for subsidies. And then the staffing, they have 29 people working, and those numbers come off of their budget reports online. And then our staffing, we have one full-time person as the airport manager and then two half-time people. So, and this, this is so hard to read, but one, yeah, this one is, is, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. It's just showing that, so this comes from the same report with the number, but just showing so that people can understand, as this looks at similar airports in Oregon and the total economic impact. Um, and what's interesting about this is we're comparing um, airports with commercial service and just um, GA airports. And you can see that, at least in this report, they're estimating that the economic activity coming just from the Benji airport is significantly higher than what's coming from the Redmond airport. And so just understanding how the two types of air, they just work differently in the system and we need to make sure that we're fo focusing energy as a region on all of our airports so that we get the greatest return. Um, and part of that is there's a whole bunch of differences in, in why those numbers are so drastically different and that would be a memo that we could provide as follow-up. Um, if you Why is, is Klamath Falls so high? So they have a, a military base? Is that what it is? The, just the military base makes that difference? Yep. And then they also have a TSA. I mean, they have commercial flights out of the, out of the Klamath Falls Airport. Oh, they do? 
Gosh, I've never flown to Thomas, um, <laughs> Medford, what's really confusing for us. I've flown to Bend. Medford, yeah, and Eugene North and all those other commercial flights, um, Salem. So, um, yeah. Interesting. It makes a huge difference. You want to sit in the military? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can. Well, I can do it here. I'm fine. The airport. So what we wanted to talk specifically was about the Ben Municipal Airport. And, and so the Ben Municipal Airport is 420 acres of city-owned property inside the county. Um, you can see that we're surrounded on three sides, maybe we'll call it three and a half sides, by privately held, owned land, and then on the north side and a hair of the east side, uh, surrounded by publicly owned land. And so when we think about the neighbors to the airport and the impact of neighbors, we're really, really aware of where and how our growth ought to be planned um, so that we can reduce those impacts on residential <coughs> uses, farming uses, um, and consider the publicly owned land to the north as appropriate places for expansion. When you're at the airport, though, most of the west side of the airport is built out. Um, and really the opportunities for expansion are all on that east side of the airport. That's where we just built our helicopter operations area. So one of the things that was identified in the last master plan is that this conflict between rotor wing and um, fixed wing aircraft could and ought to be addressed. Um, and the way they chose to address it, the FAA, is by building a helicopter only facility. And that's the helicopter operations area in the northeast corner there. Um, that is expecting to have it's got about six acres um, available today for hangar development, um, and that will really allow us to move the helicopters over to that area of the airport and get them off the apron that's right in front of the FBO. Um, when you come out for a visit, you'll see how everything is parked today, and then we'll get to be able to show you how everything ought to be parked. But the HOA is the only flight certified helicopter operations area east of the Mississippi. Um, in, yeah, so we really have the one um, only facility like that um, that the FAA has built and then flight certified. We have a history. I mean, this airport started in World War II. We're going to show you some pictures. But we've had $30 million of federal investment since 1999. Um, and we're going to show you what some of those look like in the next slides. So here's the airstrip. This is World War II. This is what things looked like. You can see the little planes and... Um, but we had a spot on the map way back when. What that you sign was for the corporate CEO, bend here. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. I don't know who that was. That wasn't even Chevlin Hickson yet, but yeah. it was someone. Um, but in 2000, this is where you see the development on the west side. Um, you can see runway 1634. We've talked about that before. That is the runway at Bend. Um, it's 5,000 feet. Um, but this is before we even had real significant taxiways. And, um, but once we get to 2004, you can see that we built taxiway A, which is the one that's, it looks like it's south on your slide, but it's west. <laughs> um, and you start to see some of the manufacturing development. Uh, this is my helicopter trip out there. <laughs> All right. Um, by 2009, we had moved the runway further away from taxiway A, and this is where you're probably familiar with that aero development. Um, I know because I wrote the traffic study for this development back in 2007 or 8, um, contemplating massive um, or just a significant investment in hangars for all different types of aviation activity on that east side of the airport. You can see here that we built taxiway B, we rehab taxiway A, you can see all that brand new asphalt, um, and then you can see the new striping on runway 1634. And then- It's all been done in how many years? In the last- Ten? Um, last so 10 years. 10 years, yep. so you put in a lot. A lot, the FAA has, we'll take, we'll really give them credit. Um, and then this is what the airport looks like today with that helicopter operations area. One of the things that um, the FAA won't, really doesn't want your airport to be a cut through <laughs> from one road, one county road to the other. Um, and so we have access off Nelson Road on the south side of the airport, which is on the left side of your screen. And then we built a new access road to McGrath Road um, on the north side of the airport so that we could have good access to that helicopter operations area. So um, you can see that L along the, the west and then south side of the helicopter operations area. That's where the hangars are contemplated for development to move the offices and the, and the briefing rooms and the facilities related to those, that helicopter training over to the east side of the airport. 
So what's the L? Yours? I don't see the L. So, can you, so on the upper left corner, you can see the striping where the helicopter, the white, there's three pads, yeah. and then there. So if you, it's sort of like the backwards L along oh, the top um, there, oh, and then. The, yeah, so. okay. Sorry. And what's going to go on there? Those are the hangers that, um, go ahead. Oh, sorry. There we go. There we go. Can see the cursor. Thank so you. you're talking about that L there. Yeah, There's going to be hangers L. there. For That's the, where the hangers the are, are contemplated. So that what we committed to the FAA as a community is that once they invested the millions of dollars in this asphalt, um, that we would move the helicopters over there and all of the aviation-related uses um, that need to be on a helicopter pad um, adjacent to that, that facility. I might add just one more thing, too. In, down in the lower... In this area, that was rebuilt at the same time as the helicopter area and reconfigured back to fixed wing. We'd been using it for helicopters, so it's reconfigured to fixed wing, and it was part of the helicopter project. So, so where are we today? So we have an adopted 2013 master plan. I'm going to, pardon, I'm going to forgive me for your eyes right now, but this um, is what was contemplated in that master plan. The yellow is the area that this master plan thought that we would have, the city of Bend, as the airport sponsor, would have to acquire to accommodate the growth that was needed then recognized in the 2013 master plan, which included a 1,000-foot extension of the runway. So we would go from 5,000 feet to 6,000 feet. I keep looking at Gary. I'm going to get these numbers right eventually. Um, and, um, and then also be able to support the um, protect the investment in the helicopter operations area with some acquired property on that northeast side. Um, and then the runway extension required some acquisition on the south part of the airport. So in 2017, so just two years ago, because of the drastic increase in activity at the Ben Municipal Airport, FAA said, your 2013 master plan isn't going to cut it contemplating a runway extension. Um, we are not ready to invest in that runway extension until we get some current numbers. The FAA funded that um, master plan this year, and the master plan is underway. Um, that master plan is not like a public facility plan that we contemplate here in Oregon. Um, this is a federal document that only cares about federal rules. They don't care if we have Oregon land use law. They don't care if neighbors adjacent to the airport don't like it. Um, their job is to make sure, we talked about in the beginning, the role of the airport, emergency response, access for aviation, that highway in the sky. So they're asking us to go ahead and put forward a master plan that will accommodate the 20 years that, of development that's expected at the Bend Airport. They care about safety. Paramount. They care about access for operations. So what are your current operations? Are there sufficient runway capacities there um, to do that? Then they start caring about other things that the rest of us might care about in the community. So what are the types of uses? What are the adjacent uses? Those types of things. But really, they, the FAA fully expects that their master plan will be taken full cloth and the, embraced by the community with open arms. So, uh, and the FAA is federal agency, but there's a lot of dollars associated with that. So that's why it's it's a high priority to follow the rules because that's where dollars can come from. Yep. So for this master plan, it's five hundred thousand dollars. Three hundred sixty thousand of it is coming from the feds. Another hundred thousand is coming from the state, and then about forty thousand, if I did my math right, um, is coming from the city of Bend. Yeah. So just understanding that scenario, when the FAA isn't just this entity, it's the funding entity that can usually be a big part of this. Yep. Yeah. And this is where we come into, so when we think about this as the airport sponsor, we are obligated, nothing is approved until the FAA approves the, approves the master plan. So as a city, it's not like, it doesn't go through a typical land use process. It is the FAA master plan, the FAA has approved it, and we adopt that by resolution. So this is not, we don't have public, we as a city don't hold public hearings. Now, the FAA master planning process does, as um, Commissioner DeBone referenced earlier. Um, we're having a whole series of public um, meetings associated with that master plan, which are required by the federal government, so they can follow their rules around NEPA and environmental assessment and all of their public planning rules. So we, right now with the master plan, have basically done our existing conditions analysis. So we've said these are the hangars, this is the condition of the taxiway, 
and this is the existing aviation activity. The FAA is now right now reviewing our existing aviation activity. We can't do anything else until that's approved. Um, we have a sense that we're going to have a longer runway extension than we thought we have in the last plan. We have a sense that there will be a second runway. We know that a control tower is on the table. Um, so there are definitely going to be elements in this adopted master plan that weren't in the 2013 adopted master plan. But the first hurdle that we have to get through with the FAA is the existing aviation um, activity. So you mentioned uh, adding 1,000 feet was part of the 13 plan. Mm -hmm. And there may be a proposal for longer now, you're saying. Yep. yep. And, and is there like magic numbers here where, you know, when you're flying an airplane, you know that it's either five, six, or what's the next? They, they're basing it on uh, the, the largest aircraft that's expected to use it on a consistent basis. And then the, the, they call the accelerate stop distance to be able to accelerate up to takeoff speed. And then something happens and they can stop is kind of what drives that. And then also just the basic takeoff length that they have for altitude that they have enough runway to get off the ground. And we're currently, uh, for the really large aircraft, it's constrained. They have to offload fuel and stuff to do it. So, yeah, elevation and summertime heat conditions probably define some of that also. Yeah. Okay. And it can lead to longer runways, yeah. wider runways, thicker runways, all of those things go into it. What? One thing that we did want to talk about a little bit just here is that we actually have quite a bit of room for new development at the airport today. We've been re working really closely with Nick and his staff to make it a clearer process for those who would like to build hangars on the Bend Municipal Airport today. So we have some current planning work that we've been doing. It's going really well, so I really appreciate the efforts um, of the Community Development Department. So in terms of what's going to happen in the next 12 months, I think we have a road, a path for hangar development or businesses that want to come in that will be cleared up this fall. Um, and then when we talk about the longer process, how do we want to adopt the master plan um, as a land use document? This is where you all have a role. So the city of Bend doesn't have a land use role, but the way that we're currently organized, the county has a land use role. And Eric, you had a question? Yeah, just a quick, quick question on the airport extension. Would that re require uh, relocation of the Powell Butte Highway? The current one, yeah. So the one that's contemplated in the plan, adopted in the plan today, um, assumes relocation of the Powell Butte Highway. Yeah, like I said, the feds the don't care about right. our. Um, what? A local road? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's in the way. Um, and But that's all federally funded. Those are all federally funded capital investments. Um, so what we think will happen is if our existing aviation activity forecasts are approved by the FAA, then it would be an even longer runway, um, but largely contemplated in the same place. So just going further, further than the current one. And who's the building official in community development? Is that Deschutes County or Bend? With the airport, it's Deschutes County. So any hangar that goes up is a Deschutes County community development application process. So I guess, I mean, I kind of need that, but I wasn't sure now. I was just thinking it through, so. Yeah, our, our building team is well-versed in hangar development. <laughs> Coordinate very closely. And if, but then if you want to connect to sewer, you've got to get a City of Bend plumbing permit and then a Deschutes County building permit. It's We've made this. People who want to build at the Bend Airport have to really want it. Well, they're going to get through this process. Is there opportunity for City of Bend to be the building official out there, or is that has that ever come up? Uh, well, if, if the county were interested in transferring jurisdiction, but otherwise it's under county jurisdiction. So we could do I mean, I guess, yeah, agreements I, has, that we could put in place if that was something. Yeah. Something to discuss, I guess. I don't know. All right. So we talked a little bit about the federal aviation and how they really don't care about any of our local rules um, and that they're the ones largely funding everything. Now, we have an amazing director in Seattle, and we have a great Department of Aviation. They understand that there are mm -hmm. some processes to go through. Um, they would love us for us to figure that out at the local level without having to get involved. Um, I've talked a little bit about the City of Bend as sponsor, um, and then you started asking questions about the role of the county. Um, and this is where I think um, Tom was alluding to as we go forward is that once the master plan is approved by the FAA and adopted by resolution by the City of Bend, then we come to you for land use adoption. We have some comprehensive plan work. Nick and Peter are going to jump in when the Economic Development Director doesn't get this totally right. Uh, but largely we're talking about comprehensive plan. Uh, making sure that the language for those comp plan designations are as modern as they can be and as forward-looking as they can be so that we're not holding 
our airport to some historic belief that we had long ago, really making sure we're, we're modernizing that language. We have to talk about how do we protect the land adjacent to the airport so we can provide certainty for the residential uses and then also certainty to protect those runway uses. Um, homes and farms right next to runways are compatible in some places, but with as busy as this airport, probably not in the long term. We need to think about the airport layout plan. So the airport layout plan is that one I showed you that contemplates what land needs to be acquired as Eric picked up where the new runway will go um, so that we have a sense of where the land needs to be protected. Right now that's adopted as part of your transportation system plan, so it's a part of your comprehensive plan. Um, and then the low, the sort of the lowest level or the nearest to us level um, is the development code. And so making sure that all of the language we have adopted in the development code after the new master plan really contemplates all of the uses in the right places um, that the comp plan and the airport layout plan um, identify, mm -hmm. adopt, approve. My planning school is coming from nowhere. Um, <laughs> so what we imagined was we really wanted to have both county staff and um, elected officials involved in our master planning process for education, for the education. So you would really understand why the runway extension. So when you use the word master planning process, you're referring to FAA master, FAA master planning master. process. Yep. So I mean, that may be important because, yeah, you, uh, you can envision all kinds of things when you say, oh, we're going to do the master plan. What does that mean? Not a public so facility. the FAA federal airport master plan. Yep. Um, really just so that the commissioners would have some sense of the trade-offs that were made during that plan, the public involvement that did take place during that plan, um, the number of neighbors who were engaged both by Gary, myself, by our consultant staff in understanding the needs, the trade-offs that, I mean I talked about trade-offs before, but really those emergency response and access trade-offs that the plan considered. Um, and then help guide us through what is the right approval process for this commission. Um, there are lots of ways that you can make decisions to make changes to your comprehensive plan. Um, and as a single property owner making an application to you, those you have some choices. Um, and we would love to know what your comfort level is doing that. And that's when Dave is starting it off. Well, I just sent Nick an email. <laughs> Asking that very issue is oh good that this is I assume this is going to be processed the county piece is a legislative otherwise it would be difficult to have the decision makers on a quasi judicial matter getting involved on this earlier piece so <laughs> have we thought this through yeah exactly so going back to what Tom's initial comments where we were thinking about a kind of a three step dance or a three step process to here first is to have the overview today which has been excellent. Then we were talking about having a tour with the commissioners, this all before any application is submitted, of course. And then the third piece would be asking the board how they want to process the application, quasi-judicial, which is how we've done it in the past. Mm -hmm. But legislative um, is also, we believe, an option. And we've always thought that's, that's a possibility because there are multiple properties involved, particularly as the master plan expands yeah. to even, even more properties. And it provides a lot more discussion with the board and participation and involvement by the board kind of from the start throughout the, the entire process. Yeah, my, my feeling is that the um, legislative is better. You know, we, when we did the West Side Transect, they wanted to do it as judicial because they didn't want us to mess with it. They wanted it to be exactly what they wanted it to be. But if you're really wanting input, it's much better for commissioners, I think, to, to be involved, be able to talk to people about what they want think as opposed to be in the role of a judge yeah, I, and I think that there all is these prohibitions about communications and I mean because you really can't idea you know brainstorm anything is it I think one of role. the pieces that I want to be very careful of and that's why we're here talking now is that I talked a little bit about the federal aviation role um, and the public involvement process that's happening as we put the federal aviation require plan together so once the plan is done I want to be as clear as we can be with particularly the neighbors adjacent to the airport that their time for input was during the FAA master planning, not in your legislative process. Um, because you don't necessarily, well, I know you're nodding, and this is the tough, really tough part about being an organ. I'm nodding because that's not what they're going to expect. Exactly. And, and it won't even occur to them. 
to be yeah. involved during the FFA. So that's so meeting. I want your help in how do we get to the right people? Who are you getting emails from about the airport that we can go talk to now? There first there aren't any right people. <laughs> There's just whoever show you know, we don't control any of that, you know, that's the thing about this. And you won't have a your ability <laughs> to legislate that airport layout plan will be minimal. Um, and your ability as a commission to legislate, I might be using the word improperly, so jump on me, please. Your ability to legislate the uses that are needed to accommodate that aviation growth will be limited um, because they'll already have been decided in the federal plan. And so we can have several, we can have a lot of conversations about that so that we're really clear on how that works because we couldn't as airport sponsor move forward with a master plan that then gets chunks taken out of it by the county as the land use authority. We couldn't say that aviation supported uses includes this whole list of industries but in Deschutes County we're not going to allow one um, or in Deschutes County we're going to somehow um, limit those um, because we would not be in compliance then with our promise to the federal government and our grant assurances. So. We are happy to have as many conversations with you ahead of time t so that we're clear on that So, because I want to be clear with the neighbors. I want to be clear with the community about what we what I talked about our job is to make decisions for neighbors on their worst day before they even know that it's coming. Um, and that's part of what happens with this plan is yeah. making sure that we're um, building out an airport that meets a federally designated use in a way that um, meets our community needs as best. <coughs> You know, for me then, I think we have to think about this a little bit because I, um, if we're not really going to be legislating it, then there's no reason to, s I'm kind of inclined to think that, well, then there's no reason to set it up like we are. I mean, don't pretend we're going to be involved when we're really not if the, everything's already been decided. And I, again, I go back to the transect. I was, it was really clear that this thing had been pushed through the city and you guys had all signed off on everything and we were just there to approve it and we did you know and I I, I challenged some things and we added some things we made some differences in a judicial way but we didn't have that much effect it was just really an up or down vote and that sounds like really what we'd be doing here so if, the, if all you really want is up or down vote I guess maybe then I'd reverse I'd go back to a quasi judicial because I was thinking if, if you really want legislative, it's better to have legislative, but well, you see so what we're I'm here, saying? yeah, we're here yeah, to lay it out it and out, work it, it through. So, cause I'm think not real clear on, you know, what's going to be the value here and the, uh, yeah. the, the media is following, you know, I was on the radio, you were on the TV the last 24 hours. So we're, yeah, this is it. We're laying it out for, and this is the struggle. You know, we could give it some study because this is somewhat new. There might be a process to run them concurrently. Um, you don't have a time issue with a legislative local process, so we wouldn't get into any time issues. The commissioners could have much more of a hands-on involvement. I recognize the federal aviation folks are going to put some some real governor on how far afield they can go, but nevertheless, that might be an option. We can explore whether that's legally feasible. I, I don't know. This is kind of new ground. One idea that's coming to me is on list. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your comments. And hope think through this. One of the things that we've thought about is historically the comp plan designation for airports has just been the airport property. Um, and maybe one thing we do is we go larger than that. So we really do have some better protections for the residential uses that are adjacent to airports so everyone can have more certainty over the next 20 years. So rather than just thinking about the airport and the airport layout plan as this piece in Deschutes County, think about some of those. And that's where the county would have much more legislative impact, not just on the airport layout plan, but how you want to envision mm. that land use development adjacent to the airport over time. There you go. I mean, that ends up being kind of a larger overlay view of the. And that's where you would, um, Commissioner Henderson, you would have more authority to decide what happens right outside that airport boundary. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Thoughts, Commissioner? Um, actually, I know some people that have businesses there. So. They are thrilled with what's going on, and um, they conveyed that to me. So, you know, it is amazing how 
busy. I've never been to the Bend Airport. I only go to Redmond. Yes, yes. So, no, I think, um, you know, it's an incredible opportunity, and I do think you want to do it right, and I'm glad the FAA is involved in, you know, lengthening, and it sounds like you could use more than three strands of barbed wire maybe around it. And, Let's you know. just keep the large animals out at this point. Yeah, well, large, small, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, so it's, it's great to hear this today and know that I know the economic activity is incredible that's going on there t now. So if we can just channel it in the right direction. So what we'd like to do is, I'll let you guys talk internally about some options for sure, and I don't mean to brag, that's not the right word. Um, and then we will schedule some time either with you as a body or individually to come out um, and meet some of the businesses. We'd love for you to tour the AirLink hangar so you can really understand what their business is. Um, come out and you can walk on the asphalt of that new helicopter operations area. You, can now, you have AirLink, but then there's the other um, flight one. Um, so there are actually, what, two in, that work out of Deschutes County? Yeah, the Life Flight, actually we have multiple air ambulance services that do come in. You do? Yeah, okay. AirLink is based there, but I think Life Flight's out of Redmond. Right. There's other okay. services that come from all over the country, sometimes just patient transport, but that's usually the, the transfer area. Okay. Um, and look, we'd love for you to see the Epic Manufacturing uh, oh. facility. Well, maybe we could schedule a time to come out and do that. And then get no, back. we should. And then let, I'll let you tell us when you want to come back, want us to come back to talk about how we want to run, what are some options for the adoption process. That sounds great. And is one of the things. FA, uh, no, excuse me. Uh, I was just going to ask, is the FAA um, planning process already underway? Mm -hmm. So that would be something maybe we could you know, find out where it is. Status. We have, so both Statuses. Councilor DeBone and then Tony, Peter, and Nick have been involved in understanding where we are with that process. Oh. We're just in the existing conditions, so we have um, a ways to go. We've had two or three public <laughs> meetings, and our next one is scheduled in November, pending well, AVA, FAA approval of our forecast. And I was invited to be involved, but then I was in this spot where I didn't know if we, if we should, so we were getting you know, different guidance. So that's why I haven't attended meetings, but I was invited, so this is why one of the I things. Of you, it's very safe for you to attend meetings. <laughs> what you would have to just declare is that you participated. Well, in yeah, as so, I say, I mean. Um, so, um, but I'm not your legal counsel. <laughs> well, and it was just guidance, and, and we're not, and so, I, so I've stood back a little bit. Well, good. I think we we need to move on to our next item. Is there other thing? Have we finished the slides? Or we really appreciate you coming in and getting us started thinking as a group about it. I know our team will get us more up to speed and we'll get back to you. Thanks so much. Everybody. Great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah, it's See you. A fabulous opportunity. So. Enjoy your retirement. Yes. <laughs> Gary, hopefully Gary will be back. Yeah, Gary, you can come in as a special consultant. <laughs> there we go. We might buy you lunch, but not much more. Yeah, go ahead. First thing after this. All right, we'll move on to item number 15. Eric, I think this is you. Uh, yes. Uh, staff is ready to kick off the 2019-2020 uh, process for Arts and Culture Grant Program. And so we, we just wanted to check in with the board to see if the board would like any changes to the grant application. Um, as background, these funds come from Video Lottery, the video, video Lottery Fund. And last spring, the board prioritized the spending of the Video Lottery do dollars and set aside $20,000 for this arts and culture grant program. Last fiscal year, there was $30,000 set aside for this program. Uh, last year, the program funded a total of 16 projects that are contained in the, the packet. And the uh, projects ranged from a low of $1,000 to a high, or at least the request, a high of $10,000. In terms of the goals of the program, um, currently it's to increase arts and culture opportunities in Deschutes County. Uh, the second goal is to make arts and culture education available to Deschutes County residents um, and to the extent they contribute to the local e economy. The um, grant application asks nonprofits to identify the target population, identify the geographic areas, the numbers of people that will be served, um, also how the program or the proposed initiative will impact the community and complement existing services. Um, and finally, there's a, a question on the application about how the Deschutes County funds will, will be leveraged from other funding sources. 
Uh, we typically have about a month where the application process is open, and then uh, staff collects the applications and reviews them with uh, the Board of Commissioners in a public meeting for determination. So we are ready to get started on the program, but just wanted to give the board an opportunity if they wanted to change anything, um, now is the time. Okay, Eric, it says that we are allocating 20,000, and yet um, you have this award listed as the totaling 31,000? Uh, yes, the, the, the 31,000 was last year. Last year, the board allocated 30,000 for this grant program, and then decided instead of 30,000 to spend 31,000, so these or, are FY numbers, that's why yeah, we're 30, 20 now. So you're talking 20s numbers. Yeah, yeah. for this current fiscal year, the board allocated 20000 for the program. You'll recall that the board also set aside some additional video lottery funds for um, forest fuels reduction and affordable housing. So, so part wait, of those funds were... Where's the request then for this year's amounts? This is before that process. This is before the process. We wanted to check in with the board. Um, before we kick off the application process, we wanted to check in and see if, if the board wanted any, any changes to the program. Oh, like definition of what we want. Yeah, just yes. Priorities, you know, the, I mean, we propose to kind of have the same process, but if the board wanted to make any changes to the criteria or anything uh, before we kick off the process, we wanted, we wanted to check in with the board. From here, what we'll do is we'll have about a, a month application period, and then we'll bring back the applications that we received to the board for consideration. Well, this is the first time since I've been here that we've even thought about that, that in terms of what should they, what questions do they answer on their application, what are we looking for, and so that's interesting. <clears throat> well, and Judith would have brought this to us in some form, so I think we have done this. It's just I thought she just brought in the I thought. She, in the she past, did. all I remember was getting the applications and looking at them. Yeah, I don't think we've re reviewed all the all the pieces of it, but I just thought it would be a good opportunity in case the board wanted to change the criteria, because once the applications come in, if if there was comment, it would be too late. Would really be is there something that we've in the past when we were going through it struggled with or or we wish we would have changed or let's see we always ask about what did we give them last year that's always a big and then how does this fit in. The other thing in the past, we have not put a dollar limit on the application itself, um, although you know the, the awards tend to be in the couple thousand dollar range. I guess one kind of pops out of me just looking through this, I haven't spent any time, but there's nothing really says why it's an arts and culture you know, grant application. What makes it arts and culture? What are they? We're always left trying to figure that out. You know, the looking back at some of these, it's like, well, what do they actually do? Like, scale house. I remember that one last year came up, and we're like, what is that? What do they do? And so I don't know if that's a, one of the broad questions we ask them or not. But you mean how how does it fit into an arts, arts and culture grant program? Yeah. You know, okay. What makes it a I just. Some of these new ones, there's been a number that we we don't know what they're new to us. There's somebody's organized them this year, or last year, and we. Well, the fact that we're only allocating twenty thousand, you're saying we can pull money from somewhere else to make it more. Well, if the board wanted to, I mean, last spring the board decided to allocate twenty thousand rather than thirty. And the part of those, the funds that, the 10000 went to the one-time projects that Ed Keith will work with the board on right. in terms of uh, fuels reduction. So that's why the program is, has less fun. What, but in answer to your question, there may be some more money that we could, mm -hmm. we, we have some that's called un, undesignated or something, right, as well, don't we? Uh, yeah, what tends to happen is sometimes the video, video lottery proceeds come in higher than budgeted or the board can transfer general fund into the video lottery. I mean, if the board wanted to spend more than 20000 on this program. 
And last year it was a thirty thousand dollar fund, which we ended up funding at thirty one thousand, just because that's how it hung together in the end. Um, I don't know. You might say um, applications with a five thousand dollar max, because we're actually doing less money, and you didn't do anything at five thousand yeah. um, in nineteen. So you did right. some five. You did, you know. Yeah, it, it looks like 5000 has been your max. Sure. Yeah, we can add that. I think that's I mean, good. it might just be good clarifying to them if they're thinking that they're going to get 10000 from the Sure, company. we can add that. I think that's good clarification and expectation setting. And then I, I would always – I would love to be able to fund $5,000 a few times, as in it's a shame when we get 20 applications and we give everybody $1,000 because then they just get a little bit of what they want to do, which is helpful, $1,000. But – you know, kind of getting to a, a more impactful uh, effort by some of these organizations is going to be funding it more fully. So I don't know if we want to put words around, you know, one or two committed $5,000. But can't these people make applications to our own personal funds? Yes, they can also apply through the discretionary right. grant program as well. So you maybe you should make note of that somewhere? That Sure, we could mention that other opportunities. But yeah, you can just leave it at 5,000 max application and then it's just a willingness to try to fund somebody larger than 1,000 or two and doing it 10 times is, is my point of view. Right. Well, we had 16 applicants last year. Yeah. So if we have 16, yes. Well, maybe, yeah, before we look at these, maybe you can see where we are in the lottery funds and stuff. Sure. Okay, well, good. That's good to think about that in terms of... Thank you for of giving us a head in advance. Yeah, that's good. You're welcome. I appreciate that. Me too. You're welcome. Well, uh, it was just confusing to me. Well, uh, well I don't think we've the application this before this way. Up. Before so, the... We, we used to just yeah, get... So it's, it's not kind of nice to think about it. Yeah. Just, yeah. All right, thank you for your input. We'll make a, those changes and we'll open the application process and get a press release out. Okay. And, and then... And, about a month and a half or two months, we'll come back before the board with the applications. Thank you, Eric. Okay, thanks, Eric. All right, so we're there for lunch recess. Did a nice job time-wise, 5 to 12. Um, so we do have um, people coming back for item number 16. Have you heard from uh, Mr. Polish as well? Okay, so that'll be a discussion. Um, Tom, I also want to, and I think uh, maybe Commissioner Dare to Bone will too, but um, would like to have Lee come back to discuss the um, the uh, Courtney Building pro project again. I got a chance to go there and look at it yesterday, so so that may be another item after the first after item 16. Would you also like to see if the engineer is available or just Lee? I think just Lee, and if um, yeah, maybe you can have his budget. The uh, mechanical engineer from SunWest. It's SunWest. No, it's yeah. not. No, they're not the, the. They're the project. The project manager was there yesterday when I was there, and he doesn't. He wouldn't be the one that we'd want the details from. It would be a. It'd probably be a mechanical engineer if we need it. But maybe it's just Lee. Just as, I mean, I, I don't think he needs an army to. I want to talk about some specific problems. Sure, sure. Just wanted to check if, in oh. case we wanted to get the engineer. Yeah. Well, I, I, my thought, I mean, if notification goes out to the project manager, engineer person you're referring to, I wouldn't mind having them in the room because, I mean, we don't well, hear from them, but, I mean, if they're going to be involved and they're available. Well, I want to ask questions specific to Lee that may influence the relationship with the project manager, I guess is my only question. He's our employee, so I, I guess I felt like talking about um, the scope of the work and the cost of the work, and and because it's our money that and the project manager is less useful to that. Um, well, I mean, it's just it's a public meeting. I was just thinking notification if we're going to be discussing it, maybe the opportunity just for that person to hear is my thought process. Um, so we'll uh, recess for now. What are we going to reconvene? And we want to reconvene at 12.30 or at 1.
Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, there's no rush for today. We're halfway through. Are you all able to be one here at 1? Okay, I think. Okay. So let's plan on that at 1 o'clock. Reconvening upstairs, yeah. So I think we're uh, going to adjourn our recess now to convene later at 1 o'clock upstairs in the Allen Room.